So if you followed the cycling fraternity or uh, the the folklore built around cyclists, heard of folks like Marco Pantani and other uh, professional cyclists, and the amount of effort that they actually put into their training, you would almost always realize that it's a masochistic sport and requires amazing amount of pain tolerance. And today we are actually joined by a by a professional cyclist who's actually. pretty much into pain tolerance and uh, pushing his body to the next level in today's episode we are joined by navin john an indian racing cyclist and an ultra human athlete he was crowned as a champion in the south asian games in the individual time trial mode of racing a form of bicycle racing where cyclists race along against the clock he is the only indian to have ridden professionally in The Division Three team back in 2016 in Australia and remains the only Indian to have spent multiple seasons racing in the U.S., Belgium, and Australia. These are incredible achievements for a person living in a country like India, which doesn't really have the elite uh, infrastructure or the methods to train meaningfully. We discuss with Naveen how he found the passion for cycling and what are the various aspects of competition that. influences his training regime we then chat about the nutrition aspect of his preparations and how he approaches it along with various insights he could gather and implement using the m1 cgm device to conclude we ask navin what are the various biomarkers he is keen to add to his health stack and optimize his performance without further ado let's get straight into it navin such a pleasure to have you here really really a big fan of all of your work and uh, of course uh, after meeting you a few months back was really looking forward to this conversation thanks for having me on mohit uh, likewise been pleasure kind of uh, being part of this ultra human tribe just learned a heap you know over the last couple months and um, yeah stuff that i'll hopefully carry forward in life and like uh, evangelize a little bit so uh, yeah cool to sit down and have a chat with you man so i've been hearing a lot about of course uh, all the progress i think you've been making terms of optimizing your training and would love to double a click on that very very soon uh, but before that would want to understand a little bit about your uh, journey what got you to cycling and uh, as a sport and uh, what was sort of like this, the back story around that yeah so uh, you know currently i ride probably a bicycle more than anyone else in india does but like rewind like you know 15 years ago is when i first found the bicycle i was as far away from a cyclist or a competitive cyclist as anyone could possibly be i was almost i grew up in the middle east and you know a 90s kid in the middle east basically the top 3 things uh, life revolved around was uh, tuitions american fast food you know and um, uh, basically spending a lot of time in shopping malls and so very kind of passive lifestyle a lot of junk food you know that was my childhood and and uh, so you wouldn't have recognized me if you saw me 15 years ago because i was close to 100 kilos and uh, so very much overweight and uh, i wasn't involved in physical activity or sport of any kind you know and uh, it was in college that i kind of discovered kind of cycling more as a social thing it was the it was the club aspect hanging out with friends you know fundraising for social causes that's what got me into cycling as an activity and then i kind of uh, somehow meandered you know your friend where was this which college was this so this was at purdue university in the, in the midwest in indiana cornfields for miles and uh, yeah studying my engineering there ran into a bunch of uh, people that i lifetime friends and they dragged me into this weird sport of lycra and you know and I, and i was hooked you know and uh, that started my journey towards weight loss i lost about uh, oh, 30 25 to 30 kilos over the course of 6 months of getting into sport you know and sport just kind of activity kind of triggered not to any conscious way it almost felt like it was something that just drew the body towards being more conscious about what i ate also it felt like it was everyone knows that equation of you know calories in calories out but uh, i was introduced to that lost a whole bunch of weight got into the competitive side of the sport and i kind of uh, Uh, I would call myself an elite, you know, amateur at that point. You know, training revolved around life. But then, about ten years ago, finished my engineering and decided to come back home to India and wanted to kind of came up with this idea of wanting to win my national championships and uh, booked a one-way ticket. 
came back here and that's where I would say my competitive elite kind of uh, pro amateur kind of you know career in cycling started and uh, yeah it's 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 been a interesting journey ever since then getting to represent the country at the top level is never something i thought i would be able to do or have the chance to do kind of just kind of uh, took it month by month year by year and ended up there you know it wasn't a grand plan or anything like that that's really cool and to understand a little bit more so you got introduced to cycling as a sport were there other sports that you had tried at that point in time what i mean cycling is considered to be very very high um, in some cases very very masochistic and very very pain oriented apart from being like a and i'm talking about the sport format not necessarily the uh, like casual cycling format but yeah what were some of the things that like drew you towards cycling that's an interesting question uh, a little bit of the psychology i mean cycling in some sense i think endurance sport in general it's um in my journey of getting into sport and physical activity i think if there were three things that i tried out it was probably running trail running the other was cycling of course and the third was i did try a couple team sports you know and i think what i was attracted towards running and cycling mainly because they're they're kind of solo sports in some sense you know it's it's almost uh, of course there is a club aspect to it you are part of the tribe of cyclists and runners but when you're out there riding or running it's a lot of a lot of times it's like time spent with yourself kind of in your head uh, of course being situationally aware so you don't end up you know in a way, uh, in the back of a car or something like that but i think that aspect of it really attracted me to cycling and even running it's that that the little bit of a solo nature to it and and you can turn the dial of hurt on cycling and running as much as you really want to you know in a team sport you kind of have to move at the pace of the group else you can't really be contributing to the team effort right in some sense so yeah i mean interesting question but yeah that definitely drew me to it and it's in fact one of the reasons why i still uh like it so much and why i'm still so drawn towards it because cycling is kind of that time that i get to myself where i can think about stuff you know and kind of resolve you know thought experiments to some end you know and so then i come back off the bike and then i don't have to think about it when i'm working and stuff like that so it it meets that dual purpose of kind of thinking and you know burning some calories while you're at it and you know being out being outdoors you still go out for those like long rides where uh, it's not a training ride but it's just like your your time with yourself yeah i wish i could to be honest i wish i could say yes there are moments you know like i suppose my life now revolves a lot around competition schedules so it's always like you know putting like this date on my training peaks and then you know there's a week countdown to it like 16 weeks and that's when you know you get really serious uh but there are moments you know kind of in a year probably two three times in a year if i'm not building up to a national championships or an asian championships where i give myself like a week or two to just ride my bike you know just take my road bike out where it shouldn't be on a gravel track or something like that behind nandi and just explore a bit you know so yeah i still i still do that not as often as i'd like to but yes definitely but uh, i think largely wanted to also double click on the mindset around competition and also uh, training for yourself what are some of the aspects of competition that actually change your training f- both from mental makeup perspective and also physical training perspective and um, yeah that would be a question to start with yeah so uh, cycling is one of those disciplines at least in the competitive side where there's a lot of different flavors of it and being part of a sport that's nascent where specialization hasn't really taken root you end up with you know cyclists in a particular discipline of road cycling who can also compete over distances of like a 40 km time trial which takes an hour or 120 or 160 km road race which takes 3 to 5 hours and then on the other end of the spectrum i can also switch my focus to like a track event a 4 km pursuit which takes 4 minutes right so all of them touch on very different bioenergetic systems right one is like fast glycolysis the other is like you know yeah. aerobic with a you know a neuromuscular at the end and so my training really ends up being really specific to the event that i'm i'm focusing on and at different times of the year it it kind of involves just kind of switching things up a little bit and usually my formula of specificity in the past when i was first kind of in this space and exploring you know training paradigms and training modalities i would always freak out you know it's like oh i have a road race that's 3 hours and then like a month later i have an event that's like an hour long you know and i would freak out about it but over time and with experience i've learned that 
you know, as long as you keep a high level of kind of basal aerobic and anaerobic fitness, like four to eight weeks, you know, eight weeks ideally of like specificity really kind of helps you sharpen up towards like a specific, you know, racing demand, you know. And so I have this formula that's kind of set that works. And of course, as far as the mental aspect of it, that's also quite different because, I mean, a four minute effort is a different kind of pain to a 40 minute effort, to an hour long effort, to a three hour effort, right? And so that's a little bit more of once you're familiar with what the pain or the, or the discomfort you're going to experience is, and once you develop like a toolkit to manage that different kind of discomforts, it's kind of like a plug and play kind of thing, you know? For a four minute effort, you can't really let the mind wander. And every minute of those four minutes, you really have to just focus on like certain process, you know, kind of tools, you know? For, for a four minute effort, it's like the basic thing I focus on is cadence, you know? I just tell myself, tap, 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 you know, cadence, right? Uh, for a three hour effort, on the other hand, my process focus would be eat and drink, you know, because if you don't fuel and hydrate over a three hour effort, you're not going to have that glycogen at the end to finish it off, right? So yeah, that's, that's kind of a little bit about how the physical preparation and the mental preparation is slightly different. That makes sense. That's, that's really cool. At what point in time, like in this entire journey, did you actually start thinking about nutrition in a super serious way? Was that from day one? Good question. And to be honest, I am one of those riders, you know, like uh, when I first started out, nutrition was for me was just about at least in an event, I didn't realize the significance of it, you know. And uh, as I started competing here at the elite level and also representing India, kind of an international competition, I was like, OK, nutrition is important and it's important on race day and it's important like in the four weeks leading into it to sharpen up, right? It's not until actually a month before I connected with you guys that, you know, I was starting to think, okay, 10 years in this sport at a top level, I've got maybe a couple more years to stay competitive, uh, where I want to be competitive. And, you know, I've kind of, I feel like I've maximized at some point you reach this phase where, okay, you're training 30 hours a week, right? Professionals train just as much you know, I've hit, I've maximized my power, you know, the power I can develop on the bike just through years of training. I've barely seen any big changes in my power at VO2 max and power at threshold, right? So what's the other thing I can optimize? And for me, I've always felt like nutrition was almost the easiest thing to optimize, you know, because with, with uh, cycling and endurance sport, the training effects and your progression is cumulative, you can't get from, you know, a threshold threshold power of X to a threshold power of Y in three months. It takes like seasons of progressive overload, right? And consistency. Whereas I always felt like nutrition was one of those things where if I set my mind to it and said, ah, okay, I really want to optimize my weight and get to this, you know, optimal racing weight. I felt like that could happen very quickly, you know? And then when I, I've worked with nutritionists in the past, but I never found it to be really effective. And I think part of it was because I wasn't mentally committed to the idea of committing to, you know, that razor sharp focus on nutrition. But then kind of with the CGM and things like that, all of a sudden I could start to quantify the impact of food and things in some way, you know. And so I was like, OK, now I can see what's happening when I eat, you know. And it, it was almost like having that data stream kind of empowered me a little bit to say, hey, let's, let's, you know, this is something new. Let's try and see if we can optimize for weight. And in fact, the last six months, I, even a couple of months before I started working with you guys, was the first time in my life that I actually tried to optimize for weight. And I got to my lowest racing weight slash lowest weight ever that I've reached as an athlete or a human, you know, ever since I was like 10, 11 years old, but functional, you know, you know, athletic weight, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, it's something that I only started looking at recently and uh, I've only started optimizing for it recently. So it's it's for me, it's like all new, you know, in some sense. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's really interesting to know. Also, I think what I recollect from um, obviously nowhere close to the level of cycling, but uh, I remember my brevet days almost 10 years back. The classic principles around fueling would be around carb loading. So you load as much carb as possible a day or two days before a brevet and um, the more you can load probably you'll end up finishing your probability of finishing will be higher essentially right that's how crude the nutrition science was for for me as well almost 10 years back and i think 
the and i was trying to read a lot more about nutrition along the way like 10 years ago but i think all the information that i got largely was around there is a lot of information actually came from bodybuilders people who actually wanted to make changes quickly in their body composition and a lot of that science is very solid extremely solid right in terms of how they change the macros and uh, but it's very very stressful as well uh, like how do you actually maintain a weighing scale and uh, the food weighing scale rather and uh, measure everything in precise order and sequence and in, in precise quantities but it's definitely a super effective uh, piece of science it's i always find it fascinating like how effective it is in terms of how it works right it's almost like the human machine is very very much elastic. boring and calculated yeah, yeah. and it's, it's very elastic yeah. it can change very quickly right with nutrition i feel like you can make certain changes and if you commit to it you can make these changes quickly whether they're lasting and whether those habits are sustainable that's a different that's a different topic altogether yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i think these are two different but tell me a little bit about your experience with the blood glucose biomarker and uh, given that we are sort of like experimenting with i mean glucose has two different connotations to cycling one is that it's an interesting zone 3 fuel so it's definitely got to do a little bit with exercise performance or cycling performance at the same time there is value on your there is value for optimization on your uh, metabolic systems glucose can also tell you a little bit about your level of insulin sensitivity or your glucose disposition capabilities etc it's quite interesting on both the aspects what have been some of your observations so a couple of big ones for me one you know i mean there's there's like uh, for me having a little bit of a biology background and things like that i always knew the theory of you know of bioenergetics you know the krebs cycle and and you know the function of mitochondria and all of that stuff right fast glycolysis and slow glycolysis and so there's the theory layer and then as an athlete you know as an athlete what you end up doing is a lot of practical stuff you know you're pushing your body you're riding hard you're riding easy you're riding long you're riding fast you're riding fasted you know etc and so you're playing around with you know bioenergetics in some sense right that continuum right and of course as an athlete with experience you start to kind of learn how to play with those things just based on experience you know when you ride 3 lakh kilometers in your life you you played a little bit with you know fueling and misfueling and all of those things and so for the first time to have something that connected those two layers you know in a very kind of real way you know of course it's only one signal in that glucose level interstitial fluid but it is a signal and it was almost like getting a signal from you know a life far away in space you know for the first time you like you get that signal and you're like oh okay and it took a while to understand because you do a ton of stuff when you're out on a bike you know even when you go out on a zone 2 ride a brevet you you're doing 200 kilometers maybe you're spending if you're a fast rider you're you're doing 5 hours i did like a 5 hour 200k the other day and if you're a slow rider you're doing it in 10 hours right but during those 10 hours it's not like you're sitting and just burning carbohydrates right i mean a brevet an out and back brevet if you did it this time of year you're going to be riding 5 hours into a headwind on the way you know if you are riding out and then you'd be riding another you know 4 and a half in a tailwind right and the energy systems that you use for those two efforts are different right and if you crest a little hill you need to go anaerobic right so not everything is glucose fueled and that connection between that experience layer as an athlete having ridden so much and the knowledge layer as you know uh, someone who's inquisitive for the first time to connect those two was super powerful for me as an athlete and also as a coach it kind of gave me this confidence to kind of tell the athletes that i work with or attempt to explain to athletes that i work with Hey, you know what? There is this signal, there is this thing, this very real thing that's happening, you know? So it's not always just you being, you know, unfit or you lacking certain capacity. You've got to acknowledge the fact that there's something going on in your body and you've got to acknowledge it and you've got to understand what's going on there. And so that CGM data allowed me for the first time to develop that connection. The other big learning for me was this, you know, when I when I started doing efforts, I slapped on the sensor and I went out for rides and you know, I started doing the different kind of workouts that I do, you know, go out to a hill and do a threshold effort, right? And the biggest thing for me was like, okay, I'm not putting any fuel in my body, right? Any glucose, external glucose, but kind of to see the response of the glucose curve go up, right? So that gluconeogenesis idea, right? So the fact that 
the effort that you're putting out actually signals to the body, okay, to release glucose that's available, you know, that's stored in our body. You know, and I knew there's a thing called muscle glycogen and liver glycogen. But to see that that actually works is super empowering. You know, the fact that you actually now know that it's not just this thing in your head. It's not just this thing you read in a textbook. The glucose, the bioavailable glucose level in your body is increasing to match the effort that you need to put out. You know, so it, it made me a little more confident to realize that, oh, I don't need to necessarily eat a crap ton before a workout if I've been fueling optimally during a week, you know. And so all of a sudden that perhaps a little bit of being in surplus in my calorie intake was now kind of, I, I said, oh, I don't need to eat this massive carb meal like, you know, three hours before my ride because I've been fueling optimally throughout the week and my body will make the glucose available as soon as I demand it to. And the second big learning for me was this, which is oftentimes if uh, it depends on how frequently you train, but I, I ride, I kind of try to sweat once a day. This is kind of like this, this idea that I borrowed from Rich Roll. You know, it's like whatever you do, try and sweat once a day. It's part of our evolutionary background in some sense, right? And towards that end, you know, some days you feel great and some days you don't feel great. And some days... You know, it takes a while to feel great, right? When you're doing some sort of physical activity. And I was like, okay, why is that? Is it all just a motivation thing? And what I realized was it goes back to this, uh, also another ritual borrowing, which is mood follows action, right? This idea that you've got to do something to feel good, right? And that will feed the feeling better, you know? And what that translates to in terms of glucose data for me that I learned was, you know, some days I'll go out on the bike and I ride for an hour at a steady kind of zone two pace. And I feel like crap. I feel like I'm carrying a bag of bricks, you know, or a sack of potatoes on my back. And I, and I looked at my glucose data when I came back from the ride and I noticed it was pretty, you know, flat, right? Not doing much. But then some point during an hour, you know, an hour and a half during a ride, when I'm fitter, it takes me longer to turn on. I realized that, you know, eventually this glucose that's available in the body kind of rises, right? And I was like, okay, why does this happen? And I was like, oh, this is where I did a little bit of an effort. You know, I signaled to the body through my effort, right, that went above zone two, call it a warm up in some sense, that, you know, hey, I need fuel right now. You know, I'm not putzing around in zone two here. I'm here to push myself a little bit, right? And so what I learned is, you know, you can actually kind of turn the switch on and off, right? And effort almost turns on that switch, right? If you're fueled well leading up into a ride, that switch is that effort that you put into the pedals to signal to your body, hey, I need some glucose now, because that ultimately fa makes you feel good when you're on the bike because, you you know, you have that fuel available. So that was just two of the things. I mean, there's a ton of smaller stuff, but that really kind of uh, made a huge impact in the last couple couple of months, making that connection, you know. That's a really phenomenal observation. I think one observation from my end broadly around this would be that uh, when I was trying to look at different switch sources, like... Essentially, uh, when I was looking at my glucose data and uh, one thing I realized was similar to what you mentioned that there is, and I used to call it the value of tears that, uh, oh, my glucose is not releasing. <laughs> I have not put in enough effort, maybe. And uh, maybe I need to put more effort and potentially body will come back with more glucose and hey, you can push harder. On certain days, I noticed that it is harder to release, get my glucose released primarily because I felt that I'm sleep deprived. And... Uh, this switch was getting harder and harder as more and more I'm sleep deprived. And uh, it was weird because that's exactly how I was feeling. Like basically when I was sleep deprived, I didn't want to work out. Even if I got into the gym and wanted to work out, this shift from feeling terrible to feeling good did not happen as much versus on normal days where almost always the switch would happen. So this is a really interesting, interesting observation. I also appreciate the fact that you mentioned that it's, and I think this is a great way to also like sort of like summarize how athletes should be thinking about the platform is that this is another stream of information about their own body. This is not a God biomarker. This is not everything that's happening in the body, right? But this is to give you another 10% maybe about what's happening in your body. And, and that would sort of like generate a chain of curiosity, potentially that, oh, maybe there is something else that also happens. And... Exactly. Um, 
this chase of curiosity actually is a very interesting process in itself yeah expanding on your thought you know on those those tired days when you go out right i feel like uh, yes on a day where you're tired and you go out or on a day where you're a little bit more stressed and you go out what i've realized that or if you're going out with a little more fatigue is that eventually you know that there is a delayed response to that kind of glucose being released you know i found like on a day where i'm incredibly stressed it takes me an hour to get to that place where you know i feel better but of course uh, as an athlete you have you know an expandable amount of time to train as a person who's got like a day job you've got a fixed amount of time to train if you're not on by the beginning it's a day where you have to accept okay i'm not going to feel i'm not going to be god mode mohit today you know in the gym <laughs> you have to accept that yeah no, so it's interesting yeah but i think i mean that that's really cool uh, that you actually brought this up and what would be i mean just final summarizing thoughts what would be like yeah another interesting biomarker that you would like to see on the platform a continuous real time biomarker wow. that you would want to see wow that's a really cool question so one of the things that uh, working with the invictus team that uh, they got me introduced to was hrv and again it's 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 another one of those things that isn't determinant of how you're going to feel on a particular day but it definitely makes you more conscious about stuff i think i think that's an interesting one to be integrated in the app if it isn't already i'm not sure if it is because yeah i mean i found hrv to be kind of interesting because it forced me to start my day with a breathing practice you know because to get that daily hrv reading it requires you to just lay on the floor two and a half minutes breathe in and breathe out and i found that quite uh, just that habit to be quite centering you know so in some sense it wasn't the biomarker itself that was empowering it was the fact that it uh, forced me into a habit you know and on crazy busy days it's hard to get into that practice but i think it's a cool biomarker to be added into that stream of things i found it really really behavior changing almost you know so yeah and it's something i still do really cool that's one of the things that will go live very very soon on the platform is our own hardware so uh, definitely nice. coming up with hrv and uh, other parameters that you can measure in real time and also hrv in real time doesn't really mean anything but i think you'll get a day yeah. level sense of hrv movement the other aspect i think that super inspired about is uh, that we might be getting very very soon lactate and ketones on the platform as well why are the lactate biomarker i think it's going to get super interesting in terms of how do you actually end up seeing your lactate threshold almost we have seen a lot of athletes measure that via a static finger prick based system it's okay, very painful yeah. it's also not that accurate versus if you have a continuous stream of data on lactates definitely changes the game also yeah. ketones because if people who want to be in ketosis and want to use yeah. ketones as fuel this sort of like tells you when do you actually start burning fat when do you start burning ketones as fuel so those are the two major upgrades coming this year and really cool. uh, of course the hardware is coming very very soon final question from my side what's your home training setup ah my home training setup i mean i have an indoor trainer which um, a wheel off indoor trainer i find that that's such a cool thing to have and i usually hop on to zwift or sometimes i just listen to some music or listen to podcasts it's my podcast slash social media update center you know because indoor rides you can you can divide your attention a little bit more because you're not worried about running into a car or something i think it's one of the most efficient ways to train as i get older i find that you know having to be on a call doesn't quite allow you to go out and ride as much as i used to in the past and I found that indoor riding is a lot more efficient. You know, you can burn three times the amount of calories you can outdoors in an hour uh, indoors than you can outdoors. And so, my indoor training setup is my is my go to. And then my yeah, outdoor training is a simple road bike. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that that's what my training setups like. Pretty basic. Right, and Zwift is pretty awesome too. I think. Oh, it's just absolutely phenomenal piece of yeah. Yeah, absolutely and the gamification of it and I mean initially I was very resistant to get on it because the gamification was something I didn't connect with maybe it was just the the way I grew up and stuff like that but eventually once the social aspect comes into it you can ride with friends I actually got drawn into it because it was a brilliant opportunity to ride with the same bunch of people that got me into cycling recently you know halfway across the globe I had to wake up at 3:30 to join them for the ride in the morning but it was worth it you know to connect with a couple of old friends on on Zwift Yeah, pretty cool piece of stuff. That is really cool. No, I I I love my Zwift setup as well. It's uh it's really cool. You can just hop on, hop off the bike. 
any time of day yeah whenever you want and uh, no it's it's been such a pleasure man navin i think uh, to connect Likewise. finally and uh, i think the uh, there's a lot uh, i learned in this podcast and in this conversation i really love the perspective around the the mindset around how you approach a biomarker or anything that's enabling you to do more with technology right uh, but combined with your instincts and your methods your own methods right because i think that's what's going to define and improve the existing technology systems we can't completely Absolutely. rely on a new technology because if you don't have instinct you can't really like technology will not Absolutely. help you and i mean just having instincts without any data might also not be the best path it might really good path but might not be the best path the power of combining these two and the mindset is something that is really interesting and uh, i certainly learned learned a lot more about that and uh, awesome. really had a, a gala time talking to you so looking forward to interacting more in the future and uh, maybe on a bike ride <laughs> awesome good stuff all right thank you navin cool Naveen's cycling career is illustrious so far and his future seems extremely bright and I think the amount of motivation he drives for millions and millions of potential cyclists in India is is just very very promising especially considering the various aspects of training that he implements on a day to day basis he's bringing a new perspective to how cyclists train if you too are a budding cyclist and want to make it big in this space I hope the episode was a thought starter for you in terms of what the ground realities are or uh, some of the things that you should be watching out for and optimizing for for being a pro cyclist and what it takes to be among the best as Naveen gears up for 2022 Asian Games we wish him all the very best and all the Indians and everyone every cyclist or cycling fan would be cheering for him on the sidelines if you like what we're doing with the ultra human podcast please share follow and subscribe to us We have a lot of prominent guests lined up in the upcoming episodes. Stay tuned and I'll see you soon with the next one.